uh, a pleasure to have a Danish professor speaking to us on the Middle East. Very rare has there been a person of this intellectual honesty, and I'm not using the words lightly, and analysis present at the club to give us an alternative view of what indeed is happening in Iraq. The last point of my introduction, ladies and gentlemen, which I earnestly recommend to all of you is the TFF website. This is a site, ladies and gentlemen, which gives you an incisive and honest analysis with substance and research to back it up as to what indeed is happening in Kosovo. Kosovo has been one of TFF's prime concerns for a number of years, Iraq, Iran, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to give a very warm FCCJ afternoon applause <laughs> to Dr. Yam and Oben. Thank you so much. Uh, I am honored and very happy to be given the opportunity to be here again. Uh, and I say again because I was here in 2003 when the Iraq uh, invasion had taken place and uh, when I was working on the book I later published which is called uh, Iraq a predictable fiasco. Unfortunately for you, it is written in Danish because I'm a Danish citizen and because the Danish government has been among the occupying powers. But it is one of the larger analyses of the conflict and why this has happened and it is also, which is I think a trademark of TFF, a prediction that has come quite true. It was a predictable fiasco. Uh, <clears throat> and talking about predictions, I believe the social science quality is to a certain extent documented by the fact that our predictions, the analyses we do, carry some weight into the future and don't turn out to be totally wrong. <clears throat> the important thing that we try to do is diagnosis of conflicts. In contrast to most media, we don't focus on the violence, we focus on the underlying conflicts. And in contrast to most media, and we are not media people, we are scholars basically, we do not focus on single individuals but on structures. And in contrast, third, to many media, we do not just show the world how bad things are and how terrible they are and how much violence there is. We try to do alternatives. Because in every situation of conflict and violence, hurt and harm, there is also a potential for a better future. Now, uh, it's, it's a formidable intellectual task to try to address what I'm going to do today, namely, what could the future of Iraq look like in 10 to 20 years from now? And what must we do now to make it possible? Having done the analysis of the place based on field trips and fact-finding in Iraq in 2002 and 2003, I feel it's a moral, political and intellectual challenge to discuss what can be done in order to replace the present um, occupation, the present catastrophe, the uh, mass murder of the Iraqi people that has now gone on for about 15 years. The point of departure is, as long as there are no better plans than continuing the occupation, the occupation will continue. George Bush said it before the war, war is the only plan in town, and he was right, because those who are against the war on Iraq did not have an idea about what to do instead of warfare. There must be alternative plans to continue the occupation. And there cannot be a forget, leave and forget, or withdraw and forget policy in Iraq. There has to be a withdrawal of the present forces, occupying forces, and a replacement with some other presence where we show as global community that we are willing to do good to a certain extent what we've done so bad. Third, we have to have arguments against the pro-occupation continuing argument, namely that if we withdraw there will be a civil war and all will be much worse, at least as long as the US is there, there's some kind of control of the local Iraqi forces. And we decided, therefore, with the knowledge we had about Iraq, to try to set up a plan for what could it look like that does not take its point of departure. Please observe that. In 
what is realistic or what do we think we can make George Bush or the European Union do tomorrow. It takes its point of departure what ought to be done if you want to help the Iraqi people. Idealistically, as it may seem, this is to me the only justifiable point of departure of discussing the future of Iraq. See that many people say, well, this is not realistic, so why are you wasting your time on it? The most interesting thing about modern history is that what we never thought would happen has actually happened. I mean, how many people predicted the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Less than one hand. So, what are we suggesting? We have a 10-point plan, and that 10-point plan, point plan does not mean that there could not be 15 and other ideas. And it does not mean that things must be done in a sequence. Linear thinking is outdated in the modern world. Maybe somebody would like to start and it has the capacities to do something on point seven. So don't take when I say point one, two, three, it's a matter of presentation. It doesn't mean that it's a, it's a strategy built into it. However, point one is the most fundamental. The foreign occupation, the troops, the mercenaries, and the bases that have been built, 14 gigantic mega bases, must go. There cannot be an improvement in the situation of the Iraqi people as long as they are occupied. And a culture of 7,000 years. I was deeply moved by my human encounter with the Iraqi people at all levels, from Tariq Aziz for hours to taxi drivers, people in the bazaars. And stuff. These people do not want to be occupied. And if we talk about continuing the occupation, we can forget about peace in this country. So point one is at point one. The U.S. must go. The question is how and what we do afterwards. Point two, the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of that state must be respected by anyone. Any discussion about partition is not for the international community to even have. It's disgraceful to see that there are people who seriously consider that this country should be partitioned. The only reason being that it's occupied. Nobody talked about partitioning this country or dividing it into three parts or something uh, when I was there. The country has not had a civil war before. It is a product of the occupation. And there are not three constituencies in this country. There are not only Kurds in the north and Sunnis in the middle and Shiites in the south. My friends, the largest Kurdish city in the world is Baghdad. 20% of one million people of Baghdad are Kurds. This country must be kept together and we must help the country to keep it together. If they want themselves by democratic methods to divide the country, that's a different matter. And that's not for me to say.